So what has the government done to help fix this problem and provide support to veterans that they've sent over to fight for a, a piece of cloth and some black gold? Well, they gamified war, everybody. Get to get your get your consoles ready to go because we got point systems attached to how many terrorists you can kill. No! Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm Krish Mohan. Before we dive into this week's episode, just as a little friendly reminder at the top of the show that if you would like to contribute to the show financially, uh, you can do so by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash Mohan. Ha ha. Uh, for only $2 a month, you get exclusive, unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling material, as well as early access to full multi-part fork full of noodles like this following episode that you're going to see you get to see both parts all in one uh earlier than anybody else would uh, and it all starts at only two dollars a month that's the cost of one cup of coffee that's one cup of coffee that's all it costs uh go check it out patreon.com slash krish mohan ha ha and uh all the work that you see in in these shows is done just by me so you'll be helping out this show uh uh, taboo table talk my diy stand-up comedy touring and much much more once again that's patreon.com slash krishmohan ha ha so before we get into this week's episode of fork full of noodles i just want to let everybody know that this episode gets into some intense subject matter uh regarding veteran suicide uh so j- just wanted to give you guys a heads up about that uh so let's get into it In his farewell speech, former president and World War II's general of the Supreme Allied Forces, Dwight D. Eisenhower, called out some problems that he foresaw for the United States. We now stand 10 years past the midpoint of a century that has witnessed four major wars among great nations. Three of these involved our own country. Despite these holocausts, America is today the strongest, the most influential, and most productive nation in the world. Understandably proud of this preeminence, we yet realize that America's leadership and prestige depend not merely upon our unmatched material progress, riches, and military strength, but on how we use our power in the interest of world peace and human betterment. This was in 1961, and among these problems, he warned us about giving into the military-industrial complex. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Eisenhower wanted us to be a thinking community and didn't want us to forget about our peaceful Methods And if we look at the way that we talk about and revere the American military, we've definitely let patriotism blind us with, a, with an Uncle Sam blindfold and, and put a star-spangled banner ball gag rendering us speechless. We've been lied to repeatedly by our government so that they can push us into wars that have only led to the destruction and creating ethical gray areas in the Middle East. He also addressed the importance of peacekeepers and treating them as equals. During the long lane of the history yet to be written, America knows that this world of ours, ever growing smaller, must avoid becoming a community of dreadful fear and hate and be instead a proud confederation of mutual trust and respect. Such a confederation must be one of equals. The weakest must come to the conference table with the same confidence as do we, protected as we are by our moral, economic, and military strength. 
Now, he did refer to these folks as the weakest because that was still the era where we had reverence for the muscly strongmen who can pull a tank with the sheer might of their butt cheeks, which I will say is uh, is a very practical application for a tank, in my opinion. But it's not true weakness. It's just a physical weakness. I mean, we're not strong enough to pull a Humvee with our teeth, but we are strong enough to say that we shouldn't go to war and set our egos aside to listen to each other so we can come up with an amicable resolution. But plus, no one can afford dental insurance, and dentists are fucking expensive, so, so your feats of physical strength are, are just not really a smart decision to make at this point. The, the economy can't handle the strain of 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 teeth being just completely mangled by because of Humvee pulling. Eisenhower's farewell address can be considered as an anti-war speech to remind us the importance of the decades of anti-war protests that we've seen. But anti-war sentiments are are, are seen as unpatriotic, anti-government, and of course, pussyfooting. And that's always been kind of an odd term to me, right? Either that means that, that you have feet like a cat and you're very nimble and like to stalk your prey at night, or you have vaginas on your feet. And, and that second one really proves how we as a society uh, are collectively failing biology on a very epic level. Look, anti-war activists are seen as, as protests against veterans for their service, but in reality, they're protesting to stop creating more veterans and stand by the ones that have already been created. And anti-war movements are where Democrats and Republicans reach across the aisle to agree to do something about them, okay? And, and what they agree on is that these movement needs to be stopped so that they can just keep putting their dicks on every table around the world with military might. Now, the Republicans use the narratives that we talked about just a few seconds ago, but Democrats are a little sneakier about it. They criticize the methods of execution in militarism. And in Trump's case, uh, this is kind of literal. The Democrats l criticized the way that he executed Iranian General Qassem Soleimani and not the fact that this was an illegal assassination. You have Joe Biden with a very convoluted statement uh, criticizing Trump sort of on, on process grounds, saying, you know, wondering whether Trump has a plan now that he's done this <laughs> and uh, warning of potential consequences, but not really an outright condemnation. Uh, and that fits in with a long, I think, you know, centrist democratic foreign policy tradition of sharing uh, with neocons and hawks in Washington similar foreign policy goals and only coming out with criticisms when it comes to narrow technical issues like tactics and uh, strategy. It reminds me of when John Kerry, uh, when he ran against uh, George uh, uh, W. Bush in 2004, on the campaign trail, his main critique of Bush when it comes to Iraq was that Bush didn't have a plan to win the peace after launching the war. And of course, it was hard for Kerry to criticize Bush on the Iraq war because Kerry, like Joe Biden, voted for that war. Oh, well, if it were me, I would have poisoned his tea. <laughs> that way, no one could have known it was me. It could have been anyone. Was it me? Oh, I'll never tell. But the Democrats themselves have become the party of war. They themselves fought against the anti-war movement. Right? During the Obama administration, they wouldn't let anybody criticize him uh, because he had just gotten the Affordable Care Act passed. And we need to celebrate that victory instead of criticizing the president. The, the Obama administration uh, went along with the wars in Yemen as well as pretty much started the war in Syria to make the Saudis happy or to keep the Saudis happy. So this this administration is doing what previous administrations have done. But um, yeah, you know, you want to bang your head against something and say this can't actually be happening to a degree. And I saw this uh, in 09. I was I was privileged to take uh, to sit in a, a Democratic House caucus meeting and I spoke to them about Afghanistan. This was like the uh, this was a less than a week after the House had passed the Affordable Care Act, uh, mm -hmm. the Obamacare, and um, 
the members of the House, the House Democratic Caucus got all excited about Afghanistan. They were standing up and saying, we can't let this go forward. We got to stop it. This is just as bad as Iraq. This is another Vietnam, et cetera. And then Speaker Pelosi stood up and she said, the president just uh, just won a huge victory. This is where his political capital lays. We cannot box him in on this. We cannot take away from his political capital. And they all sat down. Um, and that, I, that's what I'm afraid would even if you had a, a Sanders or say Warren came out and she said, I'm going to end all these wars. I'm going to cut the defense budget. When they get in the office, mm -hmm. what's their priority going to be? Their right. priority is going to be getting forward their domestic legislation or whatever. And I'm afraid they're not going to feel they have the ability mm -hmm. to do something about the military because they don't have that political cover. Uh, they don't have that capital, however you want to describe it. So nobody could bring up his increased misguided and murderous drone warfare. I mean, there were even reports of him drone bombing a wedding in the Middle East. L look, Barack, buddy, okay, there's got to be a better way to RSVP no to a wedding, right? When, when you get the invite, try this. The next time this ha I'm sure you're going to get invited to, to a war criminal's wedding. It's going to be fun. Uh, I'm sure a bunch of you will sit and hang out and talk about the countries you destabilize, whatever. But you, but when you get the invite, right, like you just, all you do, is you just take the no on there and then underneath you can write uh, and go fuck yourself. Uh, and that way, uh, no civilians died. This is a much better idea, I think. The anti-war movement gets drowned out in America because of black and white rhetoric. Uh, I think people thought that Obama was somehow going to be the anti-war candidate. In fact, he had campaigned and said he was going to bring troops from Iraq to Afghanistan, that's what he called the good war. Um, and some of the big anti-war sort of uh, elements in society, um, uh, they, they, they kind of, I, I think they, they basically packed it up. Right. Uh, and so- And in, they supported his actions in Libya and Syria specifically. It was almost impossible to organize the kind of liberal progressive wing of the anti-war movement around those conflicts because they fell for these narratives that, you know, these are such evil bad guys and evil dictators that the U.S. has a responsibility to protect civilians abroad. Right. So so you saw a different elaboration of sort of the military doctrine or strategy um, from from the Obama administration. It was a lot more sophisticated than you would say the crass um, hegemonic kind of rhetoric with us or against us history. yeah exactly so it's more sophisticated and i had an impact on the anti-war movement we in america we're the good guys and those people all the way over there they're the bad guys okay any questions and they'll paint you in the same lens as those bad guys if you speak out against the military industrial complex, just like former president and general of the Supreme Allied Forces in World War II, Dwight D. Eisenhower, you are portrayed as a terror sympathizer and just as bad as them, which is outrageous because no one in the anti-war movement is holding candlelight vigils for these terror groups in the Middle East. I mean, this kind of thinking is what leads to the criminalization of dissent, and the continued lawlessness of the legislative branch in America. And there is only one party in America, and that's the party of war. So let's take a look at some reasons that we in America should be embracing the anti-war movements despite all of these false stigmas that surround it. Our first reason to be anti-war is to question the America's the world police imperialistic narrative. Now, this was something President Eisenhower echoed a warning about in his farewell address, that America would become the world's police. And perhaps all of this is really predicated and dependent on how the word police is defined. Now, to some of us, uh, that's a safe word, right? Not like a, not like a sexy safe word. Look, I, I, it's cool if you're into role play and, and you have a, a thing for folks in uniform or something, but, but I do feel like yelling the word police is going to kind of kill the mood, kind of like how the police are, are, have been killing innocent people all across America. Now, the word police is usually associated with the notion of protecting and serving, so that's what the idea of being the world's police was initially built on, that we would be the protectors of the world. But 
I mean, if that's the only imperative that your country has, what do you do in times of peace? Well, in order to ensure that there is something to protect, America has created its own enemies and manufactured consent to continue the wars across the globe. From the now-revealed hoax surrounding the Gulf of Tonkin that got us into the Vietnam War to the more recent revelations in the Afghan papers, it's basically been revealed time and time again that America did, in fact, manufacture consent for these wars. I mean, several top generals confessed their confusion about the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, in 2002, the, the American military's battle cry was, I don't know what I've been told. Seriously, I don't, I don't get it, but I do understand what the word quagmire is now because there is a visual representation of it right in front of my eyes. Donald Rumsfeld is quoted to say, I have no visibility of who the real enemies are and that the United States is deficient in human intelligence in the regions. I mean, this is very clearly the origins of his most famous quote, the known knowns and the unknown unknowns. And now, is it very necessary to specify human intelligence? I mean, was there a lot of information gathering from the falcons that were raised by the Shah's falconer from Saudi Arabia to gather intelligence? And the problem really was that Rumsfeld forgot that he didn't speak falcon. You know, oh, what a, what a goof that war criminal is, huh? And... Three-star General Douglas Loot has been quoted to say, he, This is a quote. We were devoid of a fundamental understanding of Afghanistan. We didn't know what we were doing. Uh, he goes on, uh, what are we trying to do here? We don't have the foggiest notion of what we're... If the American people knew the magnitude of this dysfunction, 2,400 lives lost. This is, again, Loot blaming the deaths of U.S. military personnel and bureaucratic breakdowns among Congress, the Pentagon, and the state. Who will say... This was in vain. I mean, these are the people running the war. That's what the papers exposed. They were fully aware of the quagmire, the dysfunction, and the failure. Right. And this was very evident in the way that the Afghan police were trained in order to curtail terroristic threats in their own country. Special Inspector General John Sopko described it as a hopeless nightmare. And depending on who you are, I mean, you can basically just say the same thing about the American police, right? Right. The American military that trained these civilian Afghan police for six to nine months for a very complex position involved watching episodes of NCIS and cops. And again, okay, before you guys get all angry about it, this is very similar to the way that the American police is actually trained. It's, except instead of NCIS, it's just old Steven Seagal movies. And by the way, the Afghans were watching the standard NCIS, not this... L.A. and New Orleans bullshit, okay? The Afghans need to learn to love and revere a very old white man. America has deemed itself to be the good guy in these situations, but in reality, there's a very nebulous idea of the bad guy in this area. I mean, as an invading force, it's very hard to claim that you're making a positive impact. Like, I'm fairly certain that Hitler thought that he was making Poland great by blitzkrieging the shit out of their faces. Maybe, maybe America can take, like, a different military po philosophy. Perhaps one from the general of the Supreme Allied Forces in World War II and former President Dwight D. Eisenhower. At this point... Because of America's long history of interventionism in the Middle East, there's just a domino effect of failed states. Even when it tries to make an effort for societal betterment in the Middle East, America pushes racist and xenophobic views in the name of goodwill. I mean, one of their missions in Afghanistan was to get them to be culturally literate and teaching them how to wash their hands. Well, they're culturally, historically, and linguistically illiterate. Precisely. They are arriving in a country with bags of money and machine guns. Right. They're gangsters. Well, that, again, that, and that's what their real ideology is. It's, okay, we have all this money, and this will bend, you know, people to our whim. But they don't understand. It's a lot more complicated like that, uh, than that. Um, and, and what actually motivates people 
isn't as uh, as discreet or as simple as many of these. Well, just an say. example of that is one of my favorite little anecdotes. U.S. aid workers once insisted on carrying out a public health project to teach Afghans how to wash their hands, right. not knowing that Muslims with five saying five prayers a day wash their right. hands five times a day. No, so I'm Look, when Americans learn that that wiping your ass with paper is not the best way to get clean, but rather using like a spray of water is is far better. So that uh, and other countries are doing it all across the world. Countries like in Europe, in the Middle East, India, and so much more. If they once they get to that point, then then they can make a judgment call on how clean other countries are. Okay, when America starts taking care of its shithole, then it can complain about how shitholey other countries are. But we are told that these are morally good actions because we are supporting the good wars. When we think of World War II, that's, that's what we think of. We think of that as being the good war. But it's odd, right, that we went to war against the Nazis, the, the most evil organization that we could possibly think of. And when we went to war with them, we literally shot them in the fucking face. And yet... We still see them in the streets today. I mean, it turns out that violence doesn't really get rid of these shitty ideologies, but it just pisses them off. Maybe we should try intellect and less emotional outbursts that lead to creating newer versions of the same problem and fueling an industry that just fans the flames. Now, Tom Broca is known for calling World War II veterans the greatest generation, which only seemed to piss off a bunch of World War II veterans. When Tom Brokaw came out with his greatest generation, mm -hmm. there were many combat veterans of World War II who were upset about that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there were people who wrote memoirs in response mm -hmm. to get across their experiences yeah. because they didn't want people to view that as the good war yeah. look the notion of a good war is sold to us to as a false justification by the american empire so that they can dictate what is good or bad primarily the american empire being good and whoever the fuck they decide to wage war against being the bad guys there are no good or bad wars. There are only wars that take the lives of the middle class and divide us even further than we already are. Donald Rumsfeld came out and said that the only way they'd leave Afghanistan was if there was stability in the region to leave. But instabilities are caused by American interventionism, so that's a catch-22 and a confession that they're never going to fucking leave. From mistraining local forces to three-star generals that are uncertain of the mission, this haze of confusion to ensure America's place as the world's police is the primary reason we need anti-war movements to shed a light in this haze of imperialism. The second reason we need to be anti-war is to push back against the financial costs of war. And this is a, another bipartisan issue in Congress because both Democrats and Republicans believe that we need to spend more on our wars. Yeah, and I mean, even if we look ahead to, to 2020, let's hypothetically say that, you know, Biden, let's say that Biden's too toxic and he doesn't win. But yeah. let's look at Warren. I mean, Warren has been incredibly vocal about, you know, uh, making sure that our military remains strong and making sure that uh, that we, we stay on top of the war on terror and things like that. Yep. So she doesn't seem any less hawkish than the next person. No, and there's no reason to think that she would go out on a limb. Democrats like Pelosi and Warren voted to increase Trump's military budget. I mean, America's military spending is more frivolous than a teenager spending all their money at Hot Topic to feel like they're getting an authentic goth experience. Authentic God experience don't come from a fucking box store, okay? They, they come from the void in your heart because nobody understands your pain. And then, and then you listen uh, to, you know, uh, either like black metal or just uh, probably a little bit, little bit too much 
My Chemical Romance. That's where authentic goth comes from. It comes from the heart. As the Afghan papers revealed, one contractor was expected to spend about $3 million per day in just one Afghan district. Uh, one, one unidentified contractor told government interviewers he was expected to dole out $3 million daily for projects in a single Afghan district roughly the size of a U.S. county. No, I mean, it's completely perverse. Uh, and this is just, whenever you hear anyone say, you know, how are you going to pay for public health you know, programs? How are you wow. going to pay for, you know, making university tuition free? It's like, well, look at what's happening right. daily in Afghanistan and elsewhere where the U.S. military is posted. One of the things that, because, so the, essentially it's, there is no policy other than trying to buy people off. Right. Warlords, uh, uh, politicians, Karzai, and there is kind of unlimited funds to do it. But the report argues that through that tactic, uh, they destroyed the popular legitimacy of the Afghan government they were fighting to prop up, right. with judges and police chiefs and bureaucrats extorting bribes. Many Afghans soured on what was presented as democracy and turned to the Taliban to enforce order. So and, I mean, most of that involved bribing warlords and b politicians, which only made the Taliban a more legitimate governing body in that region. This wasteful spending isn't just in these false humanitarian missions, but also in weapons contracting. Right, the day that Soleimani was illegally assassinated by the American government, the stocks of the war profiteering companies like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, General Dynamics, and Boeing shot through the roof. The new impending war is good for the blood-soaked business of the elite American warlords. I mean, they sell to every side, and they're the only winners of these wars. And then again, I, I'm pretty sure they're the only ones looking to be winners in these wars. In 1961, President Eisenhower pointed out the permanent ar arms industry that spends more than all of the corporations combined. He warned us that we should not be influenced by the military-industrial complex. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. How to do this? Three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporation, corporations. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. But apparently we didn't heed his warning because we've made these war profiteers richer and richer with our never-ending conflicts. Their word. I would, I would just call it a, a never-ending war. A war that just keeps going on and on forever and ever. Because that's what you fucking need to keep this cycle of bloodshed and money pouring into your fucking pockets. 
and you know we've reached our potential for misplacing power not in the arms of the people but in corporate armaments that we think are going to defend us from an enemy that doesn't really exist but you know the sheer amount of weapons that are sold in the middle east sometimes it can it can be really hard for the american warlords to keep track of all of it in 2015 the pentagon said it lost track of 500 million dollars worth of small munitions and military equipment in yemen so who took this supply well either Iranian-backed rebels or Al-Qaeda or ISIS or the Nazis or the Bolsheviks or the Gremlins. You know, sometimes we're not even selling weapons to our enemies. They just kind of happenstance on it because America just has so many weapons that we just can't keep track of all of it. And and the way they handled it is is like the same way that a billionaire would handle losing a five dollar bill, right? They just kind of had a meeting about how to track it down, and eventually said, "Well, I have so many five dollar bills that this is just fine. Let's just make sure that we take extra secure measures to protect all of the rest of my fines. Arm the banks, like that's in Iraq. America spent twenty five billion dollars in training Iraqi soldiers, and now." The military is refusing to leave the country. It, it, it's like they're uncertain whether or not they were a good enough teacher or not, right? How, I mean, here's the thing. How much do we spend on training our people here at home to, to find a purpose or meaning in their lives or, or just to help people or, or, fuck, just to build some bridges? I mean, we have a crumbling infrastructure, but no, instead, we are overspending on crumbling the infrastructure of the Middle East instead. Th this, is, this is like the perfect and shittiest example of killing two birds with one stone. Eisenhower focused on tr reaching a balance in our society between juxtaposed idea of necessity and frivolity. Crises there will continue to be. In meeting them, whether foreign or domestic, great or small, there is a recurring temptation to feel that some spectacular and costly action could become the miraculous solution to all current difficulties. A huge increase in newer elements of our defenses, development of unrealistic programs to cure every ill in agriculture, a dramatic expansion in basic and applied research, these and many other possibilities, each possibly promising in itself, may be suggested as the only way to the road we wish to travel. But each proposal must be weighed in the light of a broader consideration, the need to maintain balance in and among national programs. But because we have let these war profiteers control the narratives of security and safety, our balances shifted and skewed. Right now, the American war economy is run as part of our debt. And as investigative journalist Bob Henley points out, debt is about social control. I think it's important to look at debt as social control the sense of you're basically as a society and this is true if it's your household or if it's a national government you're making commitments uh, for the long term for a short-term gain if you do that repeatedly as a strategy for getting by it's bankruptcy and so what we have here particularly in the case of the united states is a point where we're at i think in the next couple of years we'll be paying more in debt service that's just servicing the debt some 700 to 800 billion dollars a year which will be larger than the defense appropriation itself most americans are struggling to get by we have more debts than we know what to do with right the middle class is burdened with car loans and house debt and credit card debt and the ever so popular student debt out of this desperation, the military-industrial complex offers debt relief in exchange for your service to go fight rich people's wars. The war machine borrows money from the banks, and in turn, our needed services are cut to pay for these wars, wars that we did not ask for.
The most blatant example of social control comes from economic sanctions. Now, a lot of people don't see economic sanctions as warfare, right? The, the, the way economic sanctions are presented is, is they're just punishments for breaking the social contract of the world, right? It's like, it's like smacking a country right in the butt. That's what, but in reality, it is a punishment for rejecting imperialism. So if we really want to be accurate about what these things are, we should start calling them economic warfare. Well, a point I like to make is that even when bombs are not dropping, the U.S. is waging a very sophisticated hybrid war against countries like Iran and Venezuela. This is something you and I have spoken about together. The reality is we're constantly waging an economic war against millions of people around the world, but we don't feel as a U.S. population as though we're at war. How can we change that? Well, I think the you know the the alternative media plays a very big role. We have to um, humanize the the real what what these words mean. You know, sanctions. I mean, it sounds like it's some um, sort of like a fine or something it, that, that's on some official. And it and we don't see the the human suffering, the the tens of thousands killed in Venezuela as a result of sanctions, for instance, or you know the the half a million Iraqi children. Um, that died because of sanctions uh, between the wars. You know that that is a war. That's a form of economic war, absolutely. And you know it's causing violence all the same. In Venezuela, we saw the Western powers put economic sanctions on a country that just didn't accept the false leadership bestowed upon by the American Empire. In Venezuela, wasn't able to get billions of dollars worth of revenue uh, from its company Citgo revenue that it depends on to help people through social programs like universal health care and free groceries. And now the same issues are happening in Iran. Iran is facing economic sanctions for defying the illegal assassination of a top-ranking official on a peacekeeping mission. I apologize if I screw up the following name, but Iranian filmmaker Mashani Satrapi said, we have more in common with each other than we do our respective government. And it rings true. Economic sanctions affect the middle class of any country that they are, the sanctions are put on. And with the ever-expanding budget of the American military, the American middle class can't afford things like health care or public education and so many more of our basic needs. It's almost like fueling the military-industrial complex. There is an economic sanction being put on the American people. And by almost, I mean, that's exactly what the fuck is happening. There has never been more glaring evidence that the American empire stands against the middle class on a global scale with their fetish of putting economic sanctions on countries as an act of war. Bob Henley also talks about the way we fight these wars has changed by hiding the costs and the voluntary military. One of the things that we also need to keep in mind here is that this further notice war, which came to effect, was wholly different than any prior war the United States had fought. I'm very reliant on the brilliant scholarship of uh, Colonel Basevich, who is one of the is a top military historian, West Point graduate, and he's been writing about the change in the way that America has been fighting wars. And it's instructive. It's not just this economic way that because they actually hid the cost of the war. By the way, they not only did they do this borrowing, but then they hid the borrowing because they made it an emergency resolution mm -hmm. so we'd even see it. But a key thing that changed was we relied on a voluntary military, which meant that for the first time, America was disconnected from the stresses and strains of our military and their families. And this created the kind of notion that it was just a lifestyle choice. Historically, we fought until the war was over. As citizen soldiers, we fought until the duration. But if that duration is suspended forever in animation, then you have a further notice war and a professional class that is making their living by keeping the war going. And hence, surprise, surprise, we don't win them. Yes. It was sold to the people as a lifestyle choice, right? The work of the soldier is done at the end of the war, but at this point, these wars are never ending, so the work is never done. These wars just become something different. An evolving war is the only kind of evolution the empire believes in. And the same goes for the moral and social debt paid by the American veteran.
Which brings us to the third and fourth reasons to be anti-war, the human and veteran cost of wars. Now, this is usually not seen by a lot of the civilian population, right? Uh, most of the time we find wars to be somewhat acceptable, not just because of the security theater and the propaganda of America being the good world's police, but it's also seen as so far away. I mean, it's not in front of my face, so why should I care about it? So we don't really see the true nature of what war is, but veterans do. And when they come home, a lot of times, they bring it home with them. I mean, the sad fact is that the American veteran is one of the least taken care of persons in this country. Since the selling point of the American military is the lifestyle choice, the psychological and physical toll of warfare isn't really taken into account. 69-year-old Army veteran Jerry Holliman lost his prosthetic leg due to the fact that it might not be covered by Medicare or Medicaid. I mean, you'd think that if you served in a rich person's war, that when you come home and you need a prosthetic limb, then you'd have all that covered with the blood money they just made. You know, but, but instead, they use very vague language about the cost of all of this and what they had to do to ensure that you don't get what you need. And Holyman addresses this in the report he made to the media. He says, I signed up with the understanding that they'd take care of me if something happened. I mean, it's almost like these legislators didn't understand what the repercussions of these wars were going to be. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like they're out of touch and out to make a buck over the suffering of the middle class as they sell them the idea of patriotism without actually telling them what the fucking cost of it is going to be. Holyman is also sure that the only reason he got his prosthetics back was because he reached out and told the media. Apparently, in the case of veterans, uh, snitches don't get stitches, but rather prosthetics and medical treatments that they need. And the real question is, why aren't prosthetics clearly covered in Medicare and Medicaid? And that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the type of injuries veterans face, right? And because of the advances in military gear today, veterans are more protected, but that's just led to an increase of traumatic brain injuries. The one thing that is different, I think, for my generation uh, compared to previous generations is we have a lot more, uh, uh, is we, have, we have issues with traumatic brain injury. Um, we are surviving uh things that previous generations would have been killed in mm -hmm. um i have marines uh who were in vehicles that were blown up nine ten eleven times you know um i one time had a piece of shrapnel like this big hit my chest right you know i mean it just bounced right off you know i mean m many of us survive things that would have either wounded us or killed us and we just kept going like nothing happened what would have killed the prior generation is just causing a latency of trauma in this generation and it gives legislators uh, an excuse to say well i mean you know uh, that that traumatic brain injury could and and, and trauma it's all, all that could have been caused by by anything you know it could it could have been caused by 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 uh, shell shock or uh, an ied or or socialism it's probably socialism you, you know you just you just you just never know Along with the tri physical trauma of warfare, they also suffer a lot of psychological trauma. As Matthew Ho of the Center for International Policy explains that a quarter to a third of World War II Army veterans were discharged as a psychiatric casualty. What we know about World War II veterans is that um, it doesn't matter, and what, any veterans, it doesn't matter uh, the purpose, uh, so much as your individual actions, mm. so much as what you have done, what you have taken part in. Um, look, uh, the, uh, the number of, 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 uh, psychiatric casualties in the United States Army 
coming out of Europe in the Second World War. War. Something about one out of th- one in three, almost one in between one and three, one in four uh, uh, men who saw combat in Europe had, were discharged as a psychiatric casualty. I mean, that comes from the Army's own records. And this is stuff that PBS has reported. Yeah. You know, I mean. I mean, even in the 30s and 40s, American imperialism was so bad that a soldier's brain decided to go to war with itself. I mean, at this point, that just makes the military-industrial complex a disease, and in some cases, a pre-existing condition. And we all know that we can't just keep funding these pre-existing conditions. Most combat veterans have trauma related to the individual actions that they took part in as a result of warfare. Veteran suicides, I don't think, are anything new. Um, we, we don't have the data, but uh, anecdotally what we know, what we know uh, looking at rates of veterans uh, and various generations, looking at what we can see overseas, uh, they've looked at uh, veterans of, 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 of uh, uh, say, Serbian and Croatian veterans of those wars. You know, you see the same type of suicidality, the same uh, combat is linked to suicide. It's very clear. Uh, uh, just to get that part out of the way, uh, in 2015, the well, first of all, the first study that I know about was done by the Veterans Affairs Administration in 1991, and it clearly showed the best predictor of suicide in Vietnam veterans was combat-related guilt. Every pretty much every study that's been done has shown that. Um, in 2015, a uh, 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 the veterans, uh, uh, the National Center for Veteran Studies at uh, the University of Utah did a uh, meta-analysis of all the different literature out there, the research, and that's what it found. Yeah. You know, it, I mean, like, it, there is a clear connection. And there's a, a myth that surrounds the fact that veterans d- don't have issues when they come home. And I think this notion persists in America because of the constant hero worship and thanking veterans for their service. I'd like to uh, paraphrase a friend of mine who is a combat vet when I asked him about thanking him for his service and wishing him on Veterans Day. He said that as long as we stand up to the machine that wants to send people like him to die for the rich, we're good. So if you really want to support veterans, then be on their side and join the anti-war movement that's growing across America. But... This is not really a new sentiment, right? Back in the days of Roman imperialism, they would send soldiers who seemed mentally unstable and put them in a special camp. And this sounds really similar to how certain cultures would have a, a special tent that they would build and, uh, and, and then they would put women who were going through menstruation in them because, uh, well, the humans uh, didn't understand how vaginas worked, hence why we came up with terms like pussyfooting. But look, we didn't understand at that point that men were allowed to have feelings and thoughts, and because we didn't understand that, we sent them to a special camp that acted as an imperial psych ward for thinking about morality too much. So basically, we isolated women and men who had too many feelings. And at this point, that's about what governments have decided to regulate, human emotions. In 1991, a study showed that most Vietnam veterans committed suicide because of combat-related guilt. And this trend has persisted throughout every war. Since 2009, veteran suicide rates were increasing and have surpassed their civilian counterpoints. And I was just talking about the United States. I mean, in in Iraq, the, the, the veteran suicide rates were 14 times higher than their civilian counterparts. And as the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were going on, that rate steadily climbed. And I think it was about 2009 or so that the rate of suicide for uh, active duty members surpassed the rate of suicide for the civilian population. Um, It might have been a little bit before that. And that's very concerning because it steadily has continued has continued to climb. Um, and it, it's very concerning because that shows that there is something broken within that support system. There's something broken within that bubble um, that is 
allowing these men and women to take their own lives. Yeah. You know, the uh, rates for Iraq and Afghan veterans who are killing themselves are six times higher than uh, their civilian peers. Mm -hmm. So if you're a young man or woman who went to Iraq, you've got a six, you're six times more likely to kill yourself than someone who didn't, didn't go, right? Mm -hmm. um, for infantry units that we've tracked, the guys who've really seen the fighting, done the fighting and everything, um, we've seen rates as high as 14 times mm -hmm. as their civilian peers. Just, I mean, and that's just the case. I mean, you know, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I couldn't even begin to tell you all the number yeah. of people who've killed themselves. Yeah. So what has the government done to help fix this problem and provide support to veterans that they've sent over to fight for a, a piece of cloth and some black gold? Well, they gamified war, everybody. Get to get your get your consoles ready to go because we got point systems attached to how many terrorists you can kill. Right now, they are increasing drone warfare with unmanned aerial aircrafts to, you know, wrongfully destroy weddings and move on with our lives. Once again, there is a better way to RSVP no, Obama. There's just a better way to do it. You could just, you could just send them just like an outline. If you press like your dick on on top of the of the invite and just write an outline of it, I'm pretty sure they'll understand that that's a no. Much better way. Less people have died. It's weird and kind of creepy, but less people officially died by that by that RSVP of no. But these drone operators also face PTSD, but their PTSD is more in a in a moral and spiritual capacity, and the war machine. Well, it doesn't really care about spirituality. I don't even think it really understands what spiritualism is, right? I think the war machine believes that spiritualism is more about, like, making spirits out of our invented enemies. And then and then we'll have to shift the war again uh, and, uh, and make it a war on spirits. You know, fucking ghost wars. Government-sponsored show on the Travel Channel. For how many seasons? TBD. TBD seasons. I mean, we could see 12 or 1,200. We're not sure. Look, if you still think that the effects of war don't affect us at home, then you're wrong. The middle class is used as cannon fodder for the rich, and it comes with a large set of consequences, which includes the warping of our moral fortitude. Both the physical and psychological toll that wars take on veterans is proof that our homes are ravaged by the effects of war. Now is the time to fight back against the war machine and stand up against it. And we can start by taking care of our veterans. Supporting wars and the expansion of militarism means that our emotions are hijacked by nationalism. But... By taking on an anti-war stance, it gives us power over our emotions. It lets us think critically and ask important questions like, is this the necessary or right thing to do? Now, as Nathan P. Robinson of Current Affairs wrote, the job of an intelligent populace is to see whether these arguments actually withstand scrutiny. And it's time that we scrutinize this wasteful system. The anti-war movements might have gone dormant for a little while, but they are coming back. And we need all the support that we can get. The corporate media, a.k.a. the, the propaganda wing of the American war economy, would have you believe that the anti-war movements are not gaining steam. But after the attack on Iran, not only did we see mass po protests and demonstrations in America, but also in Iran. War affects every single one of us. Racially, it makes people who have more melanin in their skin the enemy. Financially, it cripples the middle class and uses them as cannon fodder for the rich. Environmentally, it pumps toxins into the air, not, and not only is it destroying cities and cultures across the globe, but the planet itself. And just legislatively, it just creates more hysterically nationalistic Congress members that have become mouthpieces for these never-ending wars. And it forgets the veterans that gave up their lives in service. 
Eisenhower could see the result of giving in to these vices. He saw the downfall of the empire like the soothsayer predicting the Ides of March. And it's time that we made the military-industrial complex and all the war profiteers say, a too highly patriotic American in the flyover states with the star-spangled banner truck nuts. A too. At the end of his term, President Eisenhower vowed to be an anti-war activist and a voice for peace. Disarmament with mutual honor and competence is a continuing imperative. Together we must learn how to compose differences, not with arms, but with intellect and decent purpose. Because this need is so sharp and apparent, I confess that I lay down my official responsibilities in this field with a definite sense of disappointment. As one who has witnessed the horror and the lingering sadness of war, as one who knows that another war could utterly destroy this civilization, which has been so slowly and painfully built over thousands of years. I wish I could say tonight that a lasting peace is in sight. Happily, I can say that war has been avoided. Steady progress toward our ultimate goal has been made, but so much remains to be done. As a private citizen, I shall never cease to do what little I can to help the world advance along that road. And it's high time that we do the same by joining the growing anti-war movement spreading around the globe. Hey, that's your forkful of noodles for this week. Uh, if you are a patron that has received this episode earlier than anybody else, fucking you guys are awesome. You guys rock. Uh, thank you so much for becoming a patron. And for the patrons, uh, for the people that, that aren't patrons, uh, what are you waiting for? Don't you want to get the, the early shit? Don't you want to get these multi-part forkful of noodles ahead of time before anybody else gets them and then brag about how much, uh, how much more you fucking know about any war movements because some weird fucking uh, hippie socialist kid uh, told you about them and made a couple dick jokes uh, that, that helped you remember all of them well then you should become a patron over at patreon.com slash kushmohan haha uh it, you get early access to multi-part fork full of noodles you get exclusive unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling material uh you also in certain tiers get free tickets to come see my live stand-up comedy shows and i'm going to be touring all across the country you guys i'm going to be going everywhere uh i'm also going to be recording my next comedy album pretty soon uh so if you are a fan of the material that you guys heard in this show you will probably be a fan of my live stand-up comedy show and i'm going to be touring all over the country, you guys. I'm coming to Fayetteville, Arkansas. I'm coming to Springdale, Arkansas. I'm coming to Denton, Texas. Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I'm opening for my good friend Lee Camp in Austin, Texas and Dallas, Texas. Then I'm going to be doing my full hour in Houston, Texas. In New Orleans, Louisiana. Biloxi, Mississippi. That's right. This kid's coming to Biloxi, you guys. Memphis, Tennessee, St. Louis, Missouri, Moline, Illinois, Chicago, Illinois, Indianapolis, uh, Indiana, and I'm recording my album uh, in Washington, D.C., Williamsport, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania as well. Uh, for all the details, for all the tickets, for all of my tour dates, go to my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. Uh, check out uh, past episodes of the show there, my other podcast, Taboo Table Talk, uh, The Dispatches, Road Reflections, my stand-up comedy videos, my stand-up comedy albums are on there. That's like a one-stop shop for all things Krish Mohan. So if you enjoy all of this, if you enjoy looking at this beautiful, beautiful beard, uh, which is probably the most boastful thing I'm going to say ever in my life, uh, <laughs> if, you, if you enjoy the stuff that I do, uh, that is becoming the one-stop shop for all things Krish Mohan. Um, you can sign up for my email news newsletter there as well uh you can follow my website to uh, to to get updates um uh, about uh when i put up new new content on there as well um and uh and as always thank you guys so much for watching uh making it all the way to the end of my ramblings 
I fucking love you guys. Thank you guys for be- being patrons, for being subscribers, for following me on all of the social medias. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, but uh, we've got some awesome – I've got some awesome ideas for, for uh, the next couple episodes that I am uh, working really hard on. Um, so uh, I, I hopefully there will be a, a bunch of new content coming out pretty soon uh, that I'm excited to, to, to share with you guys and talk to you guys about. So um, till next week. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on the road.